Today, we live in an exciting data revolution where technology is rapidly changing the way we work and live. At OVH Cloud, we are at the forefront of this digital shift as a leading global cloud provider and the number one cloud solution in Europe serving customers worldwide. We are independent and vertically integrated with our data centers across our own fiber optic network bringing businesses everywhere a secure and efficient alternative to the other cloud hyperscalers with complete respect for data protection. And just how are we different from the tech giants? Here are four key advantages. Our history is grounded in developing innovative efficiencies with a clear vision for a more sustainable future. We own the full value chain and we manage the product lifecycle. With our vibrant ecosystem of partners, customers, and our common goals, we offer a complete portfolio of cloud solutions in total compliance to industry and open source standards. And as an ecosystem, we are driven by purpose, united by common product values. Together, we are change makers. Building the future of technology for all, And now, let's get started. We're on set, socially distanced, so we can take off our masks. Welcome everyone, wherever you are following us live on Wired for this OVH Cloud ecosystem experience. I'm Jeremy White, Executive Editor at Wired, and I'm glad to be your host today and tomorrow for this deep dive into the OVH Cloud ecosystem. I'm here today with Michel Paulin, CEO of OVH Cloud. We'll be joined by many other guests, both here on set and from all around the world to discover how they are changing the data game together. Hello, Michel. Hello, Jeremy. So let's start. We hear often the term that data is the new black gold. Perhaps it's even a little overused. But right now, to store and compute data, one of the most essential needs for companies today is to access the cloud itself. So give us some context. Where does OVH Cloud position itself in the worldwide cloud market? OVH Cloud is a global pure player in the cloud industry. We have the chance to have 1.6 million customers in our 30 data centers. And uh, we propose a complete portfolio of solutions based on the cloud. We qualify as smart, simple to use, multi-local, which means products are developed globally, but deployed locally. Accessible thanks to our uh, competitive and predictable pricing model. Reversible, because the cloud should never become a sort of uh, jail. And uh, transparent, customers deserve to know where and how their data are stored and compute. Um, the cloud technology is one of the key building blocks of the digitalization of the society. And therefore, we have a great mission. We uh, need to turn this data revolution into a success for all, whatever the data challenges are. And our ambition is uh, to make sure that this data revolution is not that with a, a sort of hegemonic approach. And uh, we want to guarantee our customers and the total market that we can always have alternative solutions, freedom of choice. And we do that through uh, a cloud which is open, reversible, transparent, and which protects customer data and preserve data privacy. Well, freedom and transparency uh, are words often used, um, but with differing levels of success in business generally. How do you do it? What will a company find in those terms when they come to OVH Cloud? Oh, of course, uh, you will find uh, cloud solutions, but I, I think um, OVH Cloud uh, gives five key distinctive differentiators. Um, first, we do believe that uh, hybrid cloud will prevail. And um, the move to the cloud 
is something very complex for customers. And to be able to fit to each customer case, uh, we have developed a full portfolio of public and private cloud solutions under a unique umbrella, a control pattern, which allow to have an easy use. Um, we are very proud because IDC and Forrester has ranked, uh, have ranked us among the top worldwide player in the private and public cloud. The um, second uh, differentiator is uh, the fact that we proposed sovereign cloud solutions. Um, the uh, data has created a huge immense value, but it raised also uh, major concerns, ethical concerns and strategic concerns. As an, uh, a European player, we are not affected by the uh, extraterritorial laws or jurisdiction, such as the Cloud DAG. So we can propose to uh, the public sector, to the corporate, uh, trusted sovereign solutions. Um, and for example, GaiaX is, is really a platform that Europe is pushing to propose sovereign solutions. The third differentiator is uh, our competitive and predictable pricing. And this um, price performance ratio, uh, unique on the market, is a consequence of uh, a fourth differentiator which is a very different, vertically integrated model. We design and assemble our data centers. We design and build our servers in our two um, plants in France and in Canada. And um, we fully control the value chain of our uh, um, construction of servers. And it gives us a very strong cost advantage very strong cost of energy. Moreover, thanks to some innovation um, that uh, Octave has introduced 15 years ago, um, such as water cooling, we have a sustainable model. And uh, Francois, in a few minutes, will explain in detail what does it mean. The fifth uh, differentiator is uh, the ecosystem we celebrate today. Uh, we have a very rich and dynamic ecosystem. And um, OVH Cloud is a collective adventure uh, with our partners, with uh, our employees, with uh, all the ecosystems of customers, software editors. Really, we try to propose an alternative, really an alternative solutions to the market and the capacity with this ecosystem to have a third path and to give the freedom of choice. Thank you. We're actually changing the set uh, for the OVH Cloud Summit into this sort of fully digital ecosystem experience for obvious reasons. 2020 has changed the game in some very unexpected ways. Um, how would you sum up this year for OVH Cloud? Oh, wow. <laughs> 2020 is really a very strange year. Um, this dramatic COVID crisis uh, strikes families, it hurts the economy. Um, on the other hand, it creates uh, the acceleration of the digitization of the uh, so society and um, it creates a lot of op new opportunities, but also responsibilities and constraints. Um, fortunately, OVH Cloud is not affected so far. Um, so, 2020 is a sort of good year for VH Cloud. And um, despite the fact that we don't know what will be the future, OVH uh, uh, decided to continue to invest. And with Octave, we have uh, decided to move forward, to really continue to bring innovations and to invest. For example, we have made two uh, major acquisitions in the storage recently. Uh, we are investing in our data center extension. We are continuing to recruit in many locations. We are investing in revamping our uh, partnership program. Just an example, the OVH Cloud Marketplace will go internationally. And we are investing in R&D to propose new solutions with our partners and by ourselves. And tomorrow, Alain and Ludivine will describe all the exciting projects we have in front of us, and we are investing a lot. 
It's interesting you mentioned investment. Actually, it's a bit, you know it's a big theme for technology companies to invest heavily during periods of trouble or downturns or uncertainty for long term gains. Um, you agree with this? Uh, is this why you've continued to invest? Many companies right now have stopped investing. Oh, uh, we must not. We must not. Uh, on the contrary, we should accelerate. Um, this crisis demonstrates that it is imperative to introduce new innovative technologies to improve our lives, but with an ethical and sustainable approach. So that's your ambition for 2021 then, to grow a movement towards a trusted alternative to the existing digital ecosystem. Exactly. Um, 2021 will be a very exciting year. It will be the year to scale our ecosystem all across the world. And in order to change the uh, rules of the games and to propose a trusted alternative in the data world against some hegemonic giants, as frontier between our real life and our virtual life fades, Data is not anymore only a matter of innovation or an economical matter, but now it concerns ethics and even politics. And Europe has understood this very well and initiated GaiaX, a project to define the rules of the game of a transparent data world which respects and protects citizens. And this is our ambition to be part of it. Speaking about trust, this is a challenge that goes far beyond the pure business of the cloud industry. It's also linked to a geopolitical strategic vision. The European Commissioner stated that he is involved to, as he says, build the continent's economic and geopolitical sovereignty. But here today, we have a message from another notable advocate of this endeavor. Hello, Monsieur le Ministre. Ladies and gentlemen, digital technology plays a strategic role in our economies and our daily life. Digital sovereignty has become a necessary condition of sovereignty. Europe's ability to be sovereign is nowadays endangered. It is endangered by digital giants' monopoly or by extraterritorial legislation such as the Cloud Act. To be sovereign, we must freely define the rules governing digital users. And we must develop the main technologies underlying these users. One of these main technologies is data storage and processing. It is therefore of key importance to bear in mind that the production, storage and processing of data involves security constraints which must be taken into account if European data platforms are to emerge on a global scale. Mastering technologies host and process massive amount of data is critical. Ensuring that big data benefits European digital players is critical. Protecting sensitive corporate data is critical. It is a question of finding a fine balance between, on the one hand, promoting the opening up of data, which is likely to give rise to strategic and technological opportunities, and on the other hand, protecting sensitive data. As part of the recovery plan, an industrial strategy for cloud technologies will be developed. This strategy will aim at first investing in technological building blocks to develop interoperability and European capacities to host and process data. One example, we will invest to create a European marketplace for cloud services and a cloud governance. The second goal of this strategy is developing common data spaces at the national level in strategic industrial sectors. But the national strategy will never be sufficient. We need a European strategy. And this is the objective of the GaiaX project in the cloud technology. And I would like to take this opportunity to warmly thank OVH for its unfailing investments in this project. Indeed, one of the main projects we want to develop at European level is the implementation of an efficient and competitive, secure and reliable European data infrastructure so that data can be made available, collected and shared in complete security between users. This infrastructure must be open 
and designed in accordance with European values. Data security and self-determination are key factors contributing to a favorable business and innovation environment. As you all know, the GAIA-X project is intended as a marketplace bringing together, on the one hand, cloud providers, and on the other hand, users wishing to share the data in a secure, transparent, and open framework. After several rounds of negotiations with our German partners, French manufacturers are now convinced by the project and its commercial potential. 22 French and German companies are involved in the GAIA-X project as founding members. They agree to carry the initiative forward for years to come. In this respect, the rapid creation of a strategic partnership between T-Systems and OVH clearly demonstrates the importance of the challenge of developing a sovereign European cloud. I therefore welcome this Franco-German partnership and urge you to intensify your efforts in the coming month to achieve our common goals. I wish you a great conference. Thank you, Minister. Michelle, it looks like expectations are high to bring this European ecosystem to life. If you don't mind, I'll switch the screens as, speaking of GaiaX, you were the first to put a concrete partnership on the table. Floors and screens are all yours. Guten Tag, Max. Hello, Falk. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, thanks, Falk. Um, gentlemen, a few weeks ago, you surprised the cloud world with a partnership to develop a cloud platform addressing all sectors sensitive to data sovereignty. Max, as CTO of T-Systems, tell us more on where this project actually came from. Yeah, it's indeed it's indeed a remarkable project, and I think um, the the whole thing started with us, both of us, driving the Gaia X initiative forward, which in itself is also a kind of a special animal because it started in the political area, but very quickly evolved um, over to the industry, where we see a lot of demand and, and kind of positive reaction on um, on this this idea of of building. A, a sovereign stack and with that also a sovereign infrastructure for the digitalization in Europe. And I think um, when we both got involved in the whole discussion, we we realized that in order to make it truly tangible, we need to go the next step. We need to make sure we build actual platforms that follow these principles and make them available to clients that they can actually buy these services. And uh, we figured out pretty quickly that um, that the, the two companies are really complementary in that sense, right? With the strong edge that OVH has on, on the whole infrastructure space and, and us coming um, more from the operational side of the house. Uh, so together we can probably, um, we are probably best positioned to very quickly um, build these platforms. And, and that's how we kind of drove forward. And I think... Um, these are always the best projects where you see from the very beginning that you really solve a, a, a very tangible, a very important problem of our client base. Um, and, and that's why it's so much fun and that's why it also advanced so quickly. Falk, um, you're the general manager of OVH Cloud in Germany. How do you go about actually building physically and technically such a project as this? Yeah, thanks for, for that question, Jeremy. Uh, obviously, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a huge request to come up with something which, uh, delivers to a, a demanding customer base, like the government, which is probably the most demanding one when it comes to data sovereignty and security, as well as the high demand and the high standards of T-Systems. Because obviously, uh, T-Systems is known as the number one in the IT service market. So we need to, to come up uh, with a very robust and, and very solid solution that holds the promise. So it's about transparency. It's about reversibility. It's about being, a, it, we call it as a smart cloud, a smart foundation um, on the infrastructure plate where then T-Systems comes on top with the service elements. So it's the best of both worlds which addresses the high demand of, a, um, of, of that customer base. 
As you're both members of GaiaX, uh, you wanted the principles of this European initiative to be directly implemented in your solution. Uh, what are these drivers exactly, Max? Yeah, so from our side, from our viewpoint, um, the principles have two angles to it. One is um, having data sovereignty, um, which is very much around having control about the infrastructure, knowing where the data actually sits and who has access to it. And the other side is what uh, what I'd call technology sovereignty, meaning that the software stack, the software ecosystem that is being used on top of that infrastructure is, is truly open. It's based on uh, open source, but it's also under an open governance. And, and these two elements together give you control on the one hand side, but also on the other hand side, certainty that uh, you won't get locked and that you have the ability to kind of resume control, which is important, not only for the public sector, and I fully agree with Falk that these guys are the ones that have probably the highest immediate demand, but also for the industry where we see, especially around their digitalization projects, which is going to be the core of the next uh, generation of value gener uh, cre creation, where uh, this is important to be in, in control about the, the, the technologies that you are using. And, and these two elements are the ones that we drive within Gaia, and they, these are also the elements that we drive um, into our platform. And you may think, okay, Gaia is not yet defined, so how could you, how can you build a Gaia compliant platform? But I think the, 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 we follow these lines and we are committed to, evo to develop our platform further with the, with the involvement of Gaia. And I think that is really key because I hope that Gaia is going to be continuously developing and not stand still. And that's why um, uh, we, we are just marching ahead. We are driving these ideas forward into tangible products and, and we hope others do the same thing in order to get this, um, get this off the ground quickly. But Max, the route to market will be down to you at T-Systems. Are you confident this offer will find a market? Absolutely. I, I think when we talk to the clients in the public and the private sector that there's a real demand. And I also think that is important that we take this from a European angle. I mean, we are very strong as Deutsche Telekom in Germany. But uh, together with OVH, which is uh, a much, is very strong in France, but also in the rest of Europe, we want to build this to be a truly European solution, because I think that is the way how we can generate the necessary scale to, to, um, to make it um, an ecosystem that evolves uh, quickly. And so we will drive it in Germany. I truly see the demand, but I'm certain that, that uh, the, the teams also have a lot of um, uh, good traction in other countries of Europe. Falk, when will this all come to life, though? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, obviously, and luckily, we started the discussion much earlier than the announcement uh, recently. So the teams have been working in, in several work streams to, to work out uh, a plan, to work out the technology, the offering. Uh, it's not that everything has been sorted yet, but a vast majority of elements have been analyzed and pre-designed. So I'm fair to say that in a couple of months, early next year, we should be in a very good position to launch it. Thanks very much, Falk and Max. Um, I'll let you get back to the project. It sounds like you've got a lot to do there, just trying to define a new segment of the cloud market. So no more infrastructure as a service or platform as a service, but more a whole data center as a service. Um, thanks very much indeed for your time. Let's now look a little further into the OVH cloud ecosystem from another point of view. I'll stay on screen to go to Denmark and welcome an expert in the cloud market. Welcome Carla Arendt, Senior Program Director and Lead Analyst at IDC. Hi Carla. Hi Jeremy. Hi Carla, we've already been talking about the OVH cloud ecosystem, but I'm interested in your view on the challenges ahead. How would you consider the European cloud market today, if you could paint a picture for us? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, we have seen accelerated adoption of cloud services uh, during this year because European organizations have um, really found that uh, cloud technologies can help them to adapt to the new circumstances that the pandemic has created for us. 
And um, so we are, we are really seeing a huge wave of adoption, also of organizations who haven't really been looking at the cloud before. But if we look at the cloud market more from a helicopter perspective, then what we can see is that uh, the market is very dominated by um, four global cloud providers who have a market share of 73%. So there's a high concentration in the infrastructure as a service market. Um, we see a little bit more fragmentation in platform as a service and then the software as a service market is um, there, there are many different players playing. But, uh, but we see this concentration of, uh, of market share in the infrastructure as a service space. We've seen with Max and Falk that there is a step to be made for the public sector. Do you consider this an opportunity for established players then? I think they are great um, because it is a strategic concern for Europe that uh, we don't really own our cloud infrastructure where we store our data and compute our data. Um, and uh, that's why uh, I think these initiatives are being brought forward, both by the European Commission, but also by, for example, the German and French governments, and now um, with the support of many other uh, states in Europe where uh, they are working towards uh, uh, common data infrastructure, and the project is called Gaia-X. And I think it's a great initiative that really helps us to, if not control the stack, then at least control the data layer and then use the data according to European values and principles and also European regulations like GDPR, for example. So digging into this ecosystem experience, there are a lot of European initiatives within the digital services policy, as well as more local actions, of course. Um, as an analyst, how do you perceive these sovereign projects? Yes, definitely, because um, public sector, of course, uh, they, they are handling the most uh, sensitive and critical data um, for our countries. And um, we have seen that in, in the public sector, there has been a huge awareness uh, over the years that this data should reside on a local or regional or European infrastructure um, so that we really control the whole stack and also um, can put in place the, the security measures that, that are necessary. But in public sector, of course, there's also huge pressure to digitally transform and to use uh, new innovative technologies. And um, so we have seen that uh, public sector organizations are really embracing the cloud and, um, and innovate on the cloud. We see some in the data industry embracing these issues around strategic independence. Do you think there are societal dimensions in which these companies should strengthen their commitments? Yes, definitely. Around the topic of uh, sustainability, cloud providers can really help organizations um, to reach their sustainability goals and to reduce their carbon footprint. And we have seen a, a massive push this year from cloud providers um, where they uh, announce uh, very ambitious uh, carbon neutrality goals um, themselves. And uh, they, they can really help customers to, to take down the, um, the carbon footprint of their own IT operations because a cloud provider has the scale to, to run um, much more efficiently than individual organizations can do. So, Carla, do you think there is a real demand for a European cloud provider to set up? Yes, I think so. Um, and one of the reasons is, for example, the recent uh, Privacy Shield ruling, where uh, Privacy Shield as an agreement for data exchange has been uh, rendered invalid, and actually with immediate effect. And uh, I think this um, still needs to be absorbed by the market and uh, European organizations still need to process what that actually means for them. We also see that the European data protection authorities are still working on uh, providing some guidelines of what organizations should do instead. But that also shows that um, we need uh, European providers that are compliant uh, with the European laws like GDPR, because there's also concern about, for example, the US Cloud Act, which enables US courts to subpoena data um, from anywhere in the world if it's uh, needed for a court case, for example. So that is another concern um, yeah, because it could potentially um, require organizations to violate uh, GDPR because if they ha have to hand out European data to the US, but the um, citizens, European citizens haven't given their consent, then that might potentially be a violation. So, so there are concerns uh, that are more of regulatory nature that uh, definitely also um, show us the need for a European player. 
But the second aspect of that is also if we want to control our destiny in the cloud, then we need to have um, a European-owned infrastructure that we can use. Thanks very much for your view on this, Carla. It's much appreciated. Take care. We're back on stage for this OVH cloud ecosystem experience. Carla just underlined this impetus for all regarding the environmental footprint of our businesses. If innovation is required to investigate new solutions, then sustainability is more than ever a key area to invest. Therefore, I'm glad to welcome with me on stage Francois Cuny, Deputy CEO of INRA, a leading tech research ecosystem, and Francois Starin, Chief Industrial Officer at OVH Cloud. Thanks for joining me, gentlemen. Uh, Francois Cuny, I'd like to start with you if, I, if you don't mind. Um, how would you describe the relationship of the research community to this environmental imperative? Yeah, well, you know, at a period where natural resources are becoming scarce, innovating is just a necessity uh, to help sustainable world, and especially in digital world. At INRIA, the researchers, the research community has decided some years ago to put the environmental topics at the center of their research. Of course, because when you think of digital tools, one common thinking is that it is a part of the problem, of the problem of environmental uh, disease, because it uses a lot of energy to, uh, to compute. But it is also a tremendous opportunity, because it's a part of the solution. Everywhere uh, in human life, in human action, the optimization, the computation and the, the, the solution given by the algorithms makes it possible to improve the, the footprint, environmental footprint. So that's why they are so implicated. When going to the business side of innovation, research is often associated <coughs> with a D for the development. Um, how important is it for a, a research institute like yourselves to collaborate with companies like OVH Cloud? Um, I mean, is it, is it a testing field? Yeah, well, in fact, as a research institute, INRIA, you know, has got a stakeholder, which is the French government. Inside this, the French government, we have two stakeholders, in fact. The first one, of course, is the Ministry of Research. And for this ministry, our objective is to have excellence in scientific actions. That's normal. But test, the second one, which is quite specific at INRIA, is the Ministry of Industry. And for that reason, we need to put the objective of impact, and the impact for us is economical impact. That's why it's so important for us to have partnership with industry, and especially French and European industry. But, as you mentioned it in, in your question, the real point for the researchers is that working with industry is of major interest. Why? When you are working as a researcher in the numerical world, what you need is challenges, what you need is data sets. And the real data sets, the real challenges, come from the real world, where, the, where you're running the, the real conditions. And that's why we have so interesting uh, partnership with the, the industry and especially OVH. Thanks, Francois. Um, climate change is one of the top considerations uh, of any customer today. Uh, and IT is considered a, pollu a polluting business, really. Um, what are your thoughts, Francois Starin? Yeah, actually, it's, it's not that bad. Uh, thanks to the move to cloud, the data center electricity consumption has stayed surprisingly flat over the last 10 years, around 1% of the electricity worldwide, while in the meantime, internet traffic was growing 12-fold. Still, if we want to reach the Paris Climate Agreement target, we need to act as a citizen, as a company. And within OVH Cloud, we didn't wait. We have this obsession for efficiency and frugality. And what's actually good for business and for the bottom line it's also good for our environmental impact in, in that case. For instance, we use water cooling for our servers. Water, water cooling? Okay. So we actually put water on the processor to cool it <laughs> down better. So it was a brave and smart move actually in 2003 because as a result, we need minimal extra overhead electricity to cool it down. And therefore, our power usage effectiveness is between 1.1 and 1.2.25, which it's really good. The industry is almost at two. And we don't use a lot of water. We use 21 centiliters of water for each kilowatt hour. Just to give you a, a, an image, it's like using a, a tiny glass of water 
to cool down our server for 10 hours, while the industry of Reg is more like a full bottle like this. And we also operate in, in pretty low carbon grid in, in, uh, in Quebec and France. We're keeping our emission of electricity quite low. So that's our magic trio, we call, which is energy, water, and carbon. And we're leading on this. And I have more, <laughs> which is uh, we, do, we reuse a lot of our servers. Uh, we recycle them. Uh, we reuse industrial building as well. 25 of our 31 data centers are made of former industrial buildings. So that's circular economy. So we basically industrialized circular economy 10 years ago, way before it became a standard. So again, making economic and ecologic sense. Well, that, that's all very impressive, but always more can be done, can't it? Always, always more can be done. What's your plan to lower the environmental footprint in the coming years? Yeah, we should always do more, you're right. Uh, we'll keep this obsession for efficiency and frugality. We have R&D capacity to do that, but we want to go even further. Um, and so today, we commit to be carbon neutral on our operation by 2025 and use 100% renewable energy by then. And because OVH Cloud is always about going the extra mile, um, when you think about cloud and servers, very few players actually include the manufacturing phase of the server in their carbon calculation, even less reporting and even less compensation. And so we are already reporting it and we want to fully reduce it and compensate it by 2030, becoming a net zero business. But I'd be glad to come back earlier than that, obviously, right? But you can't do this alone though, can you? I mean, this is where EMEA comes in, right? Correct. We, we believe that, you know, data revolution can't be a progress if it's not done in a sustainable way. And the tech sector, which is a young, innovative one, uh, can't do it alone, as you said. So we need to engage partners and customers. We want to know, uh, we want to help the, the end users to know exactly their footprint. You would tell me, well, it's 2020 easy, right? Well, actually, when you reach a certain area like software uh, efficiency, like virtual machine, measuring it is actually not that simple. So we actually asked for help, and we're happy to join forces today with INRIA. It's almost a dream partner for a multi-year collaboration uh, that Francois called a challenge. Francois Cooney, uh, what are the research areas that INRIA has invested in for tracking sustainability? Well, yeah. Um, in fact, as I mentioned before, have a, having a partnership with OVH Cloud is a way to have access to very good and interesting subjects. And just like mentioned uh, Francois uh, in the beginning sentence, the access and giving access to the customers, to the measuring, to the monitoring of the power consumption, depending on the, the hardware they are using, is a very good subject for researchers. That's the first example. The second one is the algorithm themselves, running the servers, running the data sets, or running on the servers on, on the data sets, needs to be optimized. optimized to, go, to let lower the consumption of energy. And the last example I want to give you for the, the research interest is the fact that OVH is a global company, which is very interesting for us because they have facilities everywhere in the world, which means that they have facilities everywhere, of, uh, all the time of the day running, daylight or at night, uh, running with the, uh, under windy condition or not. And since they want to use renewable energy, this can be inserted in the algorithms that manage the scheduling of the computation to benefit from the energy, which is low power. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish you the very best indeed, gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you again. Thank you, Jeremy. Now your attention, if you please, because we're returning to a serious topic. How could anyone build a trusted cloud without the highest security standards? To answer that question, I'm honored to welcome Mr. Guillaume Poupard, Director General of the French National Cybersecurity Agency. Welcome, Guillaume. Um, we see every day the growing threat of security in a hyper-connected world. And you're on the front line in this ongoing battle, really. What are the roles and the mission of the National Cybersecurity Agency? Well, there are basically two principles in France. Um, the first one is that cybersecurity can be only in one administration or one ministry. Uh, so that's the reason why our agency, with 
600 experts already are related to the prime minister directly. But the goal is to work with all the ministries, with uh, defense, interior, economy, foreign affairs, justice, education, and well, all of them. Uh, the other principle in France is that we want to separate offensive and defensive cybersecurity. So that's the reason why we only focus on defensive side. It means that we do regulation, prevention, protection, threat analysis, uh, detection of the attacks. We do incident response with the victims themselves, but we don't do intelligence and well, we don't try to do other things. It's uh, already enough, probably. This certification of yours, the second cloud, um, could you tell us a bit more about the standard it sets in terms of security in the cloud? Well, a few years ago, we observed that the, the clients wanted to know with whom they can work to, to do cloud, to buy cloud. Uh, the goal is to know we are good and who can be trusted. Right. So for this, we need certification. So in France, we have this mechanism. Um, we've been working on this for many years now, but uh, it's just the end of the first process. And today I'm very pleased to, to say that Overge Cloud will soon be certified in France. It means that the clients can trust them to use their solutions. And the next step we are working on is to make it a, a European solution. Uh, we now have a framework, we have a law uh, called the Cybersecurity Act that enables to do certification for, for cybersecurity in Europe. And we are working on uh, cloud certification. So the goal will be to have a global European process to certify solution. This idea of building trust in the data infrastructure must be a key topic for your organization. How does it actually contribute to this move in the ecosystem? The, the very important point is the ecosystem. This right. is the, the key world. Um, if only the administrations or the victims are trying to, to deal with cybersecurity, it will not be efficient. We will want to work with research, education, startups, small companies, big ones, the ones who provide some solutions. So only working, we are, we are a small country, so we can only be efficient if everybody is working together in order to provide some good solutions. So that's the reason why we are going to announce in a few weeks the creation of a cyber campus in Paris, uh, which will be a place where people will be able to work together to do real cyber. It will be very exciting. Thank you very much, Mr. Papa. Um, I'm sure we all wish you the very best in your fight towards a more secure digital world. Thank you again. Thank you. We're meeting up again with Michelle Paulin to close together this first keynote of the OVH Cloud ecosystem experience. Hello. Um, Shell, it's been a fascinating deep dive into these challenges with this ecosystem. Uh, but it's all underlined for me how critical the question of trust in the cloud is, wouldn't you say? First, uh, thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, the credit is all theirs. Um, that's why I'm so excited to share this ecosystem with as many as possible. But let's come back first to um, the security topic. Uh, we are constantly working on security in our infrastructure and our systems. Uh, we have already many certification in many sectors, health, insurance, and also finance. And uh, we are in the process to uh, get the highest security level in France called Secnum Cloud. And we have the same uh, journey with, uh, in UK, with uh, G Cloud, um, C5 in Germany, and Agid in Italy. Trust and security are vital, and they are top priorities for us. But let's go back to the ecosystem as well, though. I mean, this is going to be an ongoing commitment for you, isn't it? Collective thinking is a never-ending commitment. So, so yes, I'm very confident about this ecosystem. Um, and we received so many positive feedback on all our initiatives. Just to illustrate with our last program, Open Trusted Cloud, we launched it during the summer a few weeks ago. And uh, we have already identified 160 pass and yes and SAS solutions which are eligible and 50 are already on board. So we believe our ecosystem is really dynamic. Uh, the ecosystem is passionate. We are passionate, so I am very confident. I am very optimistic. And that's just the beginning. Because with this uh, very dynamic ecosystem, we are creating a third path between the Chinese and European models. An ecosystem based on the same trust of values, transparency and data privacy. And as Octave says very frequently, 
thanks to this ecosystem, cela va déchirer. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and for those of you watching, don't leave us there. Stay tuned all day on the OVH Cloud Ecosystem Experience platform for breakout sessions, workshops, demos, masterclasses, and so much more. I'll leave you there for now, but we'll be here again tomorrow, same place, same time. See you then. exciting data revolution where technology is rapidly changing the way we work and live. At OVH Cloud, we are at the forefront of this digital shift as a leading global cloud provider and the number one cloud solution in Europe serving customers worldwide. We are independent and vertically integrated with our data centers across our own fiber optic network bringing businesses everywhere a secure and efficient alternative to the other cloud hyperscalers with complete respect for data protection. And just how are we different from the tech giants? Here are four key advantages. Our history is grounded in developing innovative efficiencies with a clear vision for a more sustainable future. We own the full value chain and we manage the product lifecycle. With our vibrant ecosystem of partners, customers, and our common goals, we offer a complete portfolio of cloud solutions in total compliance to industry and open source standards. And as an ecosystem, we are driven by purpose, united by common product values. Together, we are change makers, building the future of technology for all, And now, let's get started. We're back on set, socially distanced again, so let's take off our masks. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this day two of OVH Cloud Ecosystem Experience. Today, I'll share the set with two leaders of OVH Cloud, uh, CDMO Ludovina Bucci, uh, but also Alain Fiocco, CTO, plus some more guests to see how the Ecosystem Insights are actually driving their roadmap of innovative solutions. Hi, Ludwig. Hi, Jeremy. Um, first, as CDMO, let me ask, if I may, we hear the term ecosystem a great deal. Is this just a buzzword for marketing? That's a great question, Jeremy. And I understand why you're asking it. My answer is simple. At OVH Cloud, ecosystem is anything but a marketing buzzword. Okay, that's a nice sound bite, but let's try and attempt to prove that then. Um, tell me a little bit more if you can. Okay, I will share with you my personal experience. When I joined OVH Cloud back in February, everyone told me about the ecosystem mindset. Then, as I was getting to know my team, the COVID crisis hit. Immediately, my team and I decided to activate this ecosystem. As Europe was looking down, we launched Open Solidarity. This is a global initiative aimed to providing free technical solutions based on OVH cloud infrastructure to support remote work, education, and health services. This collective approach of the ecosystem expanded our ability to help businesses and customers when they most needed it. But what happened then? In just a couple of weeks, over 60 vendors joined this project, allowing hundreds of thousands of users worldwide to keep working, learning, and caring during the lockdown. Okay, but COVID hopefully 
is a temporary issue. How does the ecosystem work on a day-to-day -day basis? First of all, our ecosystem is based on strong values and a common core belief. Innovation is for freedom. These shared values are the basis of our relationship with our customers and strategic and technologic partners. We created four programs in order to better match needs and use cases. First is our partner program, which helps companies better support their digital transformation. We engage over 650 partners, such as Soprasteria, Capgemini, Cogmix, Serco, etc. Second, we have the Open Trusted Cloud program that we just launched and that grew out of open solidarity. The goal here is to co-build an ecosystem of sovereign SaaS and PaaS solutions. Third is the OVH Cloud Marketplace, which already has over 70 vendors and 250 unique solutions. Limited fees are central to its model, and it will be available for your information at Worldwide in 2021. We continue to recruit new solutions. For example, Thales will offer in January three new solutions. First is our startup program, which has just been revamped and plans to enroll over 500 new startups this year. Speaking of startup, don't miss the startup pitch contest. We will announce the winner on Thursday. How can you be sure that these four programs fulfill the market expectations though? Have you actually asked the community itself? Yes, this program has been co-designed with our community. We encourage their unlimited feedback, which gives us insights in developing innovative roadmap. The feedback also allows us to track customers and user expectation. Developing tight and trusted relations with our partners, customer and user is essential, but we don't allow this to limit our knowledge gain from ever-changing market trends. Talking about market trends, we have an expert online, Lauren Nelson, Research Director serving Infrastructure and Operations Professionals at Forrester. Lauren, thanks a lot for being with us from the US East Coast. Um, a small question to start with. Uh, could you share with us your views on the worldwide cloud market? Sure. So thanks for having me today. Um, the worldwide cloud market is growing. So the last five years, the cloud has been in hyper growth. And in, in 2019, it started to slow down. Um, cloud growth was still in double digits. But we started to see organizations stabilize their cloud strategies. Um, in 2020, that has changed. So cloud is back in hyper growth. We see organizations reporting growth numbers far above what it was in 2019. Um, empowering this, this change is a number of things. So organizations are looking to try and adapt. They see this opportunity to try and be nimble, to try and react to the new challenges that are thrown their way. And in order to do so, they're using cloud to power that transformation. Um, they're not only using the actual computing power itself, but they're also using the marketplace of tools that are readily available for them to be able to build new apps, to be able to respond to new demands that their business is facing, whether that's supply chain, ability to deliver products to their customers, or to build new ways of interacting with their business. Would you say this is actually accelerating um, some sort of developments that were taking place a few years ago and it's just got quicker now? Very much so. So when we look at cloud and in 2020, you see that a lot of the processes that are already in play have sped up, especially short wins, uh, cloud migrations, um, projects where there was a short turnaround for success, whereas longer term projects that are largely modernizations where they're trying to make large and still changes that take a longer time for value to be achieved. We're seeing those slow down slightly, um, but anything that is attached to a short-term win or real-time business need to react to their current situation has accelerated past what, what the initial plans were. How do you see the future of private cloud and what challenges that's answering? So 
private cloud in most com companies' minds is split between two different environments. One, the on-prem environment that they're managing, um, which today in, in 2020 is facing a lot of cuts, um, reduction in CapEx spending, um, and a lot of pressure to try and reduce costs in their own on-prem environment. Um, when you're looking at the other side of that question with hosted private cloud, we're seeing very similar patterns to the public cloud market. Um, with organizations accelerating their migrations, they find that private cloud has greater flexibility, greater options, elements that look more closely aligned to their on-premise environments, um, and greater options for tenancy models so that they can better meet various security and regulation um, requirements for their, for their different application types. Do you see any concerns from customers regarding costs, Lauren? I mean, there are always you know, unhappy surprises sometimes. Cost is a big topic in 2020. In fact, organizations are trying to think about their technology budgets. Um, whenever we hit a economic crisis, organizations immediately go into cost-cutting mode, especially when, when we think about technology. Um, what's different about 2020 is organizations find themselves in different modes. Um, they find that they're either in survival mode, adaptive mode, or growth mode. And based on where they're experiencing their current circumstance, their technology budget is, is affected in different ways. So, for example, someone in survival mode is, is very much looking to reduce spending, especially CapEx spending. They're delaying refreshes. They're trying to really cut where they can. Um, anything that is considered discretionary spending. Somebody in adaptive mode is thinking about, well, how do we focus our spending on responding to our current reality? How do we focus our spending on things that matter most? Whereas organizations in growth mode are increasing their technology budgets and trying to figure out how do we deliver all of this new demand while maintaining our expected customer experience? So budgets very much mean different things to different companies today. When you're thinking about ways of cutting costs in the cloud, some of the big ones that come up, so private cloud is actually a way companies have been heavily reducing cost of cloud in overall cloud spend. Um, they're leveraging this for better configuration fits. They're leveraging it for better tenancy models to respond to regulatory requirements in a more cost affordable manner. Um, they're also looking at tools like cloud cost optimization solutions to look for cloud spending waste, to be able to look for areas where they haven't had the correct configurations in place where they're right sizing their instance resources. Um, and they're also looking at areas where they might be able to use uh, reserved instances or longer commitments in time to be able to reduce their spend. Um, so there are a lot of different techniques that companies are using today, but it is very much for the majority of companies. It just looks very different for companies depending on what their current mode is. Thank you, Lauren. I'm back with you, Ludivine. How does OBH Cloud use these market insights that Lauren just referred to? Some would say OBH Cloud has grown as a product-centric company. It's true if we consider that our sales and marketing teams have developed quick recently in the past 21 years. But the fact is that users have always been central to OVH Cloud's roadmap. Our technical teams work closely with them. This partnership starts with our founder, Octave Klaba, who still work with our customer to discover the needs and create technical solution. This unique approach and the close relationship we have with them is really important for us. We've developed creative solutions, such as the private cloud, where we have been pioneers. We've also developed our four universes and a better fit with market usage. Web cloud, bare metal cloud, public cloud, and hosted private cloud. They are the outcomes of work with and for our user. Let's let Luc Durso, CEO of Fatempo, talk about his experience as a long-time active ecosystem customer. Welcome, Luc. Thank you. Hello. Hello. How did you find your place within the OVH cloud experience? Well, we began our partnership with OVH for Wux Open, a uh, subsidiary of our group. Uh, we needed to offer our SMB's customers uh, confidentiality and uh, territoriality uh, for the externalized data. Uh, so we have to host them on a sovereign platform. 
Then uh, we joined the OVH marketplace to offer our solution to the largest numbers. Uh, today you can find our solution for backup, for instance, uh, backup solution for laptops uh, directly online. Last March, uh, we answered the Cedricso appeal for the mobilization of the French tech ecosystem. We were first in line uh, to support the OVH uh, Open Solidarity Initiative. And uh, we were able to offer for free our solutions in a period during which the cyber community was doubling in intensity and impact. More recently, uh, we have also joined with Atempo, the Open Trusted Cloud Platform. The reason why is that we wanted to offer a package uh, solution for customers, large customers, who care about the confidentiality and the jurisdiction of the data. And we wanted to package this solution, so we are offering massive data migration, either for the off-site, either from uh, American platforms, back to uh, OVH Sovereign Platform. This uh, solution is also offering backup and archiving uh, capabilities and features. And uh, of course, it makes a, a unique value proposal for large accounts. With the cancellation of the privacy shield, I think it makes a lot of sense for public major players uh, and as well for uh, vital service providers. Okay, but um, any company has well-defined routes to market. What, how, how different is this, though? I think what is uh, interesting about the OVH ecosystem is that it works a little bit like a neural network. Uh, it's not only a business flow between the, the software vendor and OVH itself, the business circulates among the members and uh, that makes a lot of difference. For instance, we can uh, bundle highly op interoperable solutions within a, a package solution and uh, this kind of solution is satisfying a lot of customers today because we can offer homogeneous and also uh, protection, performance and security within the European jurisdiction boundaries. Thank you, Luke. Ludovine, um, one last word before we switch to the tech section with Elaine. How far down this path to a developed ecosystem are you? We are really just getting started. Thanks to this ecosystem, we're developing a real alternative to the big players. We'll succeed in co-creating a cloud that makes data revolution a success for all, only by working together as an ecosystem and completely changing the game. Let's take a look now on the tech side. I'm more than happy to welcome with me on stage Alain Fiocco, the CTO of OVH Cloud, to learn more about the roadmap his teams develop within this unique ecosystem. Hi, Alain. Now tell us about CVH Cloud's innovation journey. Most companies state they're always innovating, but what they really mean is iterative improvements. What are you doing and how are you going to change the cloud industry? So make no mistake, right? Iterative improvement is okay, it's good, and we have to do it. <laughs> but um, what we've tried to do recently and uh, in the past as well is to basically talk to customers and try to find out really what they want in terms of use cases. And based on that, try to look at, from the ground up, how we can build systems that will drive innovation. So instead of looking at little innovation, we're actually looking truly from the ground up at the foundation. And this way, for example, the, the last uh, few months, we've been looking at um, what are the, where the customers are going in terms of performance improvements, in terms of resiliency, and we've built systems starting from the, uh, the, the real the infrastructure and the servers and how we assemble components into the servers to deliver the true value. Based on that, you can truly innovate at the service level. Talking of the customers and talking to them, so you know, how is this different to what they were demanding before? Is the, you know, if you, it's not like you've just discovered this, surely. It's like, so what were they asking before to what they're asking now? Yeah, so there is clearly a change in the way um, in what the customers are requesting in terms of performance, resiliency, uh, scale. We've had in the past also because we've been addressing a different type of customers more recently, you know, more like very large enterprises and government institutions, public sector, this kind of things. We've actually been asked to deliver much higher scale, much higher resiliency, much higher performance than we used to. And on top of that, um, the use case is also evolving. 
a lot of the data that was stored in the cloud in the past, even in recent past, was actually accessed by a relatively traditional workflow. Those workflows are evolving for more real-time, more uh, direct interactions with the images for doing artificial intelligence, uh, real-time machine learning, real-time prediction. That requires much more capacity and much more performance that uh, we used to, uh, to deliver in the past. That way, we uh, basically had to rethink quite uh, significantly the way the infrastructure is being built. And what sort of size you know, companies are you talking about demanding this sort of change though? Like, are you talking about everybody, the SMEs as well, or are you talking about just the big operators that want this change? No, we're talking about different things actually. We're talking about uh, big uh, enterprises, for example, public sector institutions, but we're also talking about more digital native companies that require some very specific and niche um, you know, infrastructure for delivering, for example, artificial intelligences. Sometimes those uh, companies are not necessarily very big, but they are providing services to big companies and they have to deal with state-of-the-art uh, kind of workflows and, uh, and applications. And what sort of learnings have you had to do to actually increase this scale, increase this size? Because you don't, you can't, it's not like turning on a tap, you know, extra resources, extra people, you know, extra learnings. How have you managed to and upscale like this. Exactly. And every time you change something for the better, you have to change all the elements that connect to it, right? So it's, it's really a, a something that you have to do in an iterative way. But um, let me give you an example, right? If you provide more CPU capacity, more compute capacity, very quickly, the next bottleneck is going to be access to storage. You remove that bottleneck, there will be another bottleneck that comes out, uh, which is the network. And so we really had to look at the whole system on how we deliver a super high speed uh, infrastructure, fabric infrastructure in the data center. How do we connect servers to it? How do we connect storage to it? Enable east to west traffic with no contention. And that way the system itself scale and everybody, all the services that we put on top, public cloud, hosted private cloud, uh, and any kind of services will benefit from that infrastructure improvement. This sounds significant. What's the level of investment you've had to do to actually do that? Timing-wise, you mean, um, well, we're talking about it. This is something that has started quite a while back. Um, and in terms of investment in CapEx, this is what we do, right? Uh, OVH Cloud is about building infrastructure and renting it out to customers. So nothing really different, except that the scale and the size of what uh, we've been doing is actually quite significant. Let me give you just another additional example. We are right now building two new data centers just to address the needs for trusted cloud security for public sector and critical infrastructure operator. Okay, well, that touches on the next question I have for you, which is about new opportunities using the cloud. And that sounds like one of them right there. So, you know, we talk about hybrid cloud all mm -hmm. the time. There are many different definitions of it. Perhaps you'd like to give me your own because I've heard many. <laughs> um, so, you know, what are the opportunities here? You mentioned public, but also hybrid. Yeah, so, um, I guess there are many definitions of what it is because there are many different places where the customers are coming from, right? Not every customer is, is equal. So uh, definitely, you know, people are operating private cloud. That means on-prem, uh, in-house, using cloud technologies to the, to, the, to the extent that this is possible. Then uh, what we're providing in our case is we can transpose this into our cloud and we do hosted private cloud. So no changes in what you do, you have dedicated resources, except that instead of being on-prem, now this is within OVH and we deliver that. Uh, we've launched a product uh, just a few months ago called uh, Hosted Private Cloud Premier to address specifically that use case, lift and shift kind of, kind of uh, uh, transition to the cloud. And the minute you put this in the cloud, as of a sudden you get the elasticity and the scale that you would get, uh, that you get from the cloud. So that's one way of looking at it. Um, customers very often don't go, I shut this one off and I enable this one. They use both, right? And this is the reason why we say hybrid. You need to provide that seamless connectivity and the seamless uh, possibility to transition processes and workloads from here to here, storage from here to there and back and so on. Then there is a multi-cloud. So a number of companies, sometimes they don't even have on-prem uh, uh, infrastructure. There are a number of companies that are using multiple clouds for two reasons. Either for diversity, they want to have the resiliency that two different clouds provider would provide, but they also may have some specific needs that only one will provide at a, at a, at a point in time because of a specific niche technology or because, because of a particular geographical coverage. And in that case, they may want to use this one for this uh, purpose and this one for another use case but they still need those two things to collaborate and work together. 
um, maintaining, for example, consistency on the way you manage security, on the way you manage your users, on the way you manage the rights uh, of your users, and so on and so forth. That's multi-cloud. If you have two, great, but if you have three and four, then, then it becomes truly a multi-cloud infrastructure. In our case, we even have multiple cloud into our own service portfolio. You know, there are customers consuming public cloud, that is, shared resources. We also have customers consuming hosted private cloud that's dedicated resource. They still want to have the communication going between the two. They still want to use that as a common platform. So we offer all that flexibility. We offer the, the possibility to connect those things together so customers can consume whatever they want, as they want, and build a solution, a custom solution. And lately, we've actually extended the reach of this and enabled the customers to connect from outside with OBH Cloud Connect and the partnerships that we've uh, announced with Equinix and Megaport. So any customers can connect to those uh, telecom providers, let's say, and connect back into OVH Cloud anywhere in the world, because those, those uh, two partners have hundreds of uh, points of presence uh, globally. We haven't talked about 5G at all. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously, there's lots of talk about with the cloud and obviously the edge computing and obviously 5G and how the effect that will have on that. Is this, I mean, you know, you're obviously working on a lot at the moment for the immediate future and how you will innovate in that space. But you no, know, we're talking a bit further down the line here. What are your thoughts on that? Is it even necessary for people to start thinking in these terms right now? That's a good question, and, and that would require a very long talk, but, uh, <laughs> but let me try to make it very short. Um, when people are talking about edge, they, they don't necessarily mean edge uh, you know, at the back of the antenna, right? Sometimes edge is um, kind of a, there is a difference between a far edge and a close edge. Uh, a lot of the application would be very, very happy in terms of uh, transit delay between the user and the cloud, uh, the computer, the storage infrastructure, in a matter of one or two milliseconds. If you do that, you know, the kind of radius that you need to cover a large country like France or Germany or UK, we're not talking about thousands of sites, we're talking about a few dozens. And that, to me, looks like a cloud, right? Um, maybe an extended one compared to what we have today, but still, we're talking about cloud uh, infrastructure. When we're talking about the far edge, uh, like for 5G, for new application, which frankly we haven't seen yet, um, then, then in that case, yeah, eventually the, we need to put resources outside in the in the wild, let's say, but still manage them centrally by using the uh, the cloud, uh, you know, technical stack. Okay, so five G is possible investment for the future. Then, so let's talk about more present day stuff. So earlier this year, you uh, launched a major upgrade to the hosted private cloud range. Is that right? Yes, this is right. But before we go there, let me, uh, let me give you a little bit of uh, history here. What we did, in fact, is we rethought the entire portfolio of high-end bare metal uh, servers. And to such a point that we've, we've really started from the ground up, as I said, um, and we are delivering, we will be delivering in the coming months a completely new range of the high-end uh, bare metal cloud servers with things like uh, you know, clusters for hyper-converged infrastructure, software-defined storage, pre-installed software. The reason why I'm saying this is because this is what we used to deliver Premiere. Right. We took all of that and we co-designed with VMware the next generation of hosted private cloud. The hosted private cloud is something that we've had in the portfolio for quite a long time. We are delivering a software-defined data center stack to customers coming from VMware. And uh, this has been going on, this relationship has been going on for 10 years. Over the last uh, six, uh, 12 months, we've actually redesigned this product based on the new infrastructure. As a consequence, we're bringing to market something that is unmatched in the industry in terms of performance, resiliency, and price. And, and the, the code development with VMware has brought us to, to, to that level, and we will continue to enhance this platform. That was the first incarnation of this new infrastructure. So, very proud of that. This is up and running. This has been in production for uh, almost six months now, and customers' feedback is actually very, very good. Okay, so let's ask VMware how it actually works being part of this ecosystem. We're lucky to be online in the US, with the West Coast, with VMware CEO Pat Gelsinger. Hi there, Pat. Can you hear me? Hi, Jeremy. Great to be with you today. What does OVH Cloud represent for VMware as a cloud provider? Why is it important to have sovereign and regional players, do you think? 
Well, first, I'd like to just say thank you and OVH Cloud. You know, they've been a great partner with VMware for quite a number of years now, and we've partnered globally as well as there in Europe. So what a pleasure to be able to join and speak at this event. And what we've seen is that, uh, you know, co companies want to be able to have that strong local player to meet some of their sovereign needs uh, for the most sensitive workloads, government workloads, where data privacy requirements are the highest uh, in the industry. And this ability to be both a very large and powerful player like OVH Cloud, but also be there in Europe and uh, be that local player as well, a powerful combination. And we're very excited with the announcements uh, back in July of the Premier Cloud offering. And you know, since that availability, customers are on it. We're seeing great interest in the marketplace for the VMware OVH Premier offering. So I think we're clearly on to the right strategy together. Well, how does OVH Cloud strategy fit into VMware's product portfolio, as you mentioned it, and you know, a, a multi and a hybrid cloud strategy at that? Yeah, and we're, we're, we're on this path to a multi-cloud. And we think every customer wants this idea of how can I harness the power of multiple clouds? And we spent a lot of time building our partnerships with Amazon, with Azure, Google, Oracle, IBM, Alibaba. But you combine that with the regional players like OVH Cloud, and now you have a potent combination. Being able to leverage that hyperscale and that global uh, footprint, but also being able to utilize powerful local players like OVH uh, Cloud, and that's the multi-cloud future. And combining that with private cloud and hybrid and multiple cloud, that's where OVH Cloud plays such a powerful role for us in our strategy. But it isn't just that. It's also that they're adding on top of it the developer layer as well. And our partnership around the Tanzu offering, which brings containers and Kubernetes into the offering, says we're delivering the developer platform and the infrastructure to run it. So overall, OVH Cloud, a great partner, strategically aligned. We look forward to the great things we do in the future, building on the great things we've already done in the marketplace together. And thanks so much for the opportunity to join today. That's excellent. Thanks very much for your time, Pat. It's much appreciated. Thanks very much, Pat. It certainly sounds like you two are both excited about this collaboration. It's always great to hear it from Pat. But one thing very unique we are doing with this platform, we've actually took it and um, submitted the certification with the uh, National Security Agency. I was mentioning the needs for public sector and uh, critical infrastructure operator for you know, uh, a trusted environment. So we've actually asked the, um, the National Security Agency to certify it. The certification is called Secnum Cloud. That's probably one of the most stringent uh, qualification process in, uh, in the industry. So we're very proud that we've been able to go through that. This is not pub completely public yet, but this is coming very, very soon. Let's talk about data and the ability to enable AI and ML. Um, Storid needs and the solutions for it have been around for decades. Um, we've gotten, have we gotten to the pivotal moment yet in the industry where the promise of insight and prediction is genuine thanks to AI, not you know, something that we've had before where it's been sort of you know, false promises. Are we actually there? Yeah. Good point. So two things, right? In order to gain insight, in order to be able to do prediction, in order, in order to be able to really leverage the data for value, you need two things. First of all, you need the data, obviously, and you need to have the computing power to mine this data to get the insight. And you also need to have the algorithms and the, uh, and the data scientists um, infrastructure and workflow to be able to do that. We're coming to that point and we're coming to that point from two angles. First of all, the type of data that we are storing nowadays have changed quite a bit over the last few years. There have been a change because we used to have very structured data, databases, lines and columns. Now we have a lot of unstructured data, speech, images, movies, streams of IoT sensors. All of that information is being stored and has been stored for quite, a, quite some time now. These companies don't know quite what to do with it. Exactly. The, the thing, but it's not necessarily that they don't know what to do, is how they are actually going to mine this data. And nowadays we're coming to a point where the data is actually uh, coming together with the capacity to uh, effectively use it. So we're doing two things at OVH to 
kind of sustain that momentum. One is we, in the storage space, we've actually accelerated dramatically with a couple of acquisitions to be able to deliver a storage infrastructure that will meet those requirements, both in terms of capacity, which we were doing uh, for already, but also in terms of performance. Because the minute you manipulate the data, when you do AI, for example, you need a lot of I.O., you need a lot of performance to this storage, and you need multiple tiers of storage so that you have the right price performance ratio at any tier. And so we, we actually accelerating on that. We made a couple of acquisitions over the summer. Uh, in on the second, uh, on the other side, we now um, customers and partners and the data scientist ecosystem to launch machine learning, uh, data processing, and AI processes at scale without having necessarily to understand what's happening underneath. You know, all the nitty gritty details about, you know, all the systems that you need to orchestrate all of that. This is impediment to the data scientist. They don't want to know about that. They want to bring their um, AI and the machine learning algorithm and just get, get the data and just uh, mine it. So we are delivering that to them. It's going to be very, very simple. People are going to have to decide what they want to do with the data, where is the data, bring the code to, to actually manipulate the data, and they're going to be charged by the time they use the GPU. Um, this is that simple, right? They're going to launch the, the jobs. We're going to run the jobs for them with all the monitoring. We give them the result. If it lasts 30 seconds, we charge them for 30 seconds. If it lasts three hours, we charge them for three hours. The trick there is knowing what to do with the data. Like you say, oh, it's simple. You just want to know what you want to do with the data. That's the hard part. That's true. Uh, and this is where a lot of the ecosystem is coming together, right? You have a lot of uh, sometimes small companies, but very innovative companies that are working on algorithm on AI. So some are specializing in speech, right? Speech to speech. Others are specializing in uh, natural language processing. Others are specializing in uh, manipulating the, the images and the, and the pictures and so on and so forth. All of those, we provide the platform for them to scale and democratize the use of this uh, AI. Let's talk about the ecosystem again. The ecosystem, how will the ecosystem develop and maintain innovation for all of its users? Again, that's something easy to say, but it's very hard to do. How are you going to maintain this? Yeah, well, so yes, I agree with you. This is very hard to do. So, you know, we'll see what happens. We'll see if we are successful. But the, the thing is, in our case, we're trying to provide platform for these ecosystem players to come and develop their value. They don't have to redevelop anything underneath. So we make it easier for them to get to market and to scale. And this is our value proposition to them and to their customers, right? So now they can deploy this at scale. They can industrialize those processes, right? I mean, up until now, it was very much researchy type of uh, activities. Now we're getting to a point where we need to really deploy and scale at production level. And speaking of natural language processing, you're working with a natural language processing company right now, aren't you? Yeah, indeed, um, called Hugging Face. They are the hot startup in that field of natural language processing. They are in the mission to democratize NLP, and we are here to help them, just provide them the infrastructure to run their AI jobs for them and their customers. And we're glad to have the CTO on stage with us here today, actually. Welcome. Julianne Shulman, thanks for joining us. Hi. Um, two questions for you. Uh, what's the value for you of a cloud service to host, launch, and monitor specialized AI jobs? Yeah, so first, uh, Hugging Face is an open source machine learning company based uh, in New York and Paris. And our goal is to, is to advance artificial intelligence and natural language processing through open uh, source and open science. We have more than a thousand uh, users and customers, companies using our open source in production. And in a lot of cases, uh, they want to train large scale um, models in the cloud. And so OVH Cloud is a good uh, cloud provider for them because they get access to state of the art uh, GPU capabilities. Modern artificial intelligence needs really good GPUs, and uh, basically the Rolls Royce of GPUs is the NVIDIA V100, and uh, that's a good thing because that's what OVH Cloud has. So this is the sort of thing that uh, OVH Cloud can do to better serve customers and sort of democratize and help the use of NLP, would you say? Our users 
launch uh, large scale trainings. So uh, they need access to a scalable um, pool of uh, GPUs and uh, also storage for uh, data sets and models. Um, and OVH Cloud is great because uh, they get the ability to scale to multiple, uh, to a, a large number of GPUs. Excellent. Thanks very much for your time, Julian. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Let's close this second keynote of the OVH Cloud ecosystem experience with you, Elaine. Thanks so much for this incredible journey into the ecosystem you have. And um, you and I could talk for hours on this, but try to sum it up in a few words if you could. What's coming up on the roadmap shortly? You've seen the roadmap is, uh, there is a lot to, to announce over the next few weeks and months. But let me start first by saying that you've seen that we're leveraging the ecosystem a lot. Um, so, you know, Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, Samsung, VMware, uh, we're gonna launch a few things with NetApp and Nutanix as well in the coming uh, weeks, a month rather, end of December. Um, we will be launching a new storage solutions based on NetApp on tap. Early January, we're gonna have those two new ranges of uh, bare metal servers and clusters that we are gonna make available. Scale and high grade are the two, the two ranges, very high end. Um, we're gonna also make them available with pre-installed software on it, uh, such as Nutanix and NetApp again. Uh, moving into February, March and the spring, uh, you will see a lot of things in the public cloud, uh, object storage solutions, high performance object storage, high performance block storage, uh, and, a, and a revamp of the, the public cloud as well. So this is endless, it never ends. This roadmap is fueling the four universes, bare metal cloud, hosted private cloud, public cloud, and web cloud. So it really never ends. Thanks so much, Elaine. Um, that's all from us uh, at this OVH Cloud ecosystem experience. But stay tuned all day for more and more content, breakout sessions, workshops, demos, masterclasses, and so much more. Tomorrow, same place, same time, you'll have a unique chance to meet with OVH Cloud founder, Octave Klaver. For now, bye-bye.
We are seated and socially distanced. We can take the mask off. And hello, Octave Clabin. Hello. And hello to you all. Welcome here on the set of the Ecosystem Experience with Octave Clabin, of course. Before we do get a glimpse at what's coming up for the next five years at OVH Cloud, I've got a question for you. Where are you at right now? So, uh, last five years, uh, Customers they ask us uh, to become a global player. In order to uh, to uh, to have the, all these expansions, uh, we raised 250 million with two funds, Towerbrook and KKR. Uh, we tripled number of the data centers we are building uh, in Germany, Poland, Great Britain, the U.S., Singapore, Australia. Of course, we uh, developed new product, and mainly we started development of a public cloud platform. And we created a new channel uh, to be able to work with the large companies. And we developed that in, mainly in France. Now we are going after that in Germany. So I bet that those are the bases you are going to build on for the next five years to come. What will be your top priorities for this new plan? So uh, now our customers, they ask us to be on top in public cloud, in public cloud platform. Uh, so this is what we started five years ago. And after five years, we continue to invest in this platform. So uh, our platform is based on the OpenStack. Uh, and we will invest in seven different areas. So that include the compute, storage, database, network, securities, there is big data and AI. And public cloud is definitely the battleground right now. But it's also kind of a race against time. It takes time to build a product, a proper product. So do you think you will match the time frame here? You're yeah, right that it takes uh, usually two or three years to build a product that is profitable. Um, so we just have five years, so how we will achieve that? So this is why we, we have chosen to make the acquisitions. Uh, and this is how acquisitions will help us to achieve these strategic, strategic goals. So if I do understand you well, 20 acquisitions over the next five years, that's a lot. Do you think that there's that many startups that can actually match your ambitions out there on the market? It takes a lot of money to actually buy. You know, a company. Yeah, this is an exciting topic. But you know, there were so many innovative startups in US and EU, in Europe. Uh, I've met a lot of them uh, for the last two years. And in fact, it's a win win uh, um, uh, acquisition because they have developed a technology and they want to scale. And in fact, we have the customers, we have the means, we have data center, geographic expansions. So we can help them to, to allow, in fact, uh, scale this technology. And this is what our customers, they ask us. To be more accurate, will you go public? So, you know, uh, pub going public is not the only way. We have already very good, uh, great partners, financial partners, and we're looking for the new partners. And uh, the, the mainly issue, the mainly things that we were looking for is that new partners, they respect our vision, they respect our values, uh, as uh, we are the biggest European cloud provider. But if I may, um, buzzword or you know, values seems to be one of the buzzword we do use today. Um, what specific values are we talking about here? So uh, that's, that, I, I like this question because it's really something that I, uh, it's fundamental for us. So for example, our products has to be smart. Smart is five letters. It's as as simple to use, but simple to understand. Multi-local, that means that we are everywhere in the world. We want to be everywhere in the world uh, with the local team 
for the support with uh, local contract, with the local language, local currencies. Um, uh, uh, we are very good on prices. This is what we call accessible and predictive, predictable on the, on the price. Uh, we also, uh, our product has to be reversible. Uh, we need to use standards so customer can come to OVH and can leave us as he wants. And the uh, transparency. So, for example, uh, reversibility, it's really important and this is how we want to build this platform, OpenStack platform that we just talked about. It's that we, we, we want to open source this platform uh, based on the OpenStack, but also based on this all the acquisition that we, uh, we, we will do. So maybe you can ask me uh, why uh, we want to open source all the, all the code that we will acquire, but... And I definitely will, actually. <laughs> everybody is developing on their own, their own code. Uh, and the result is there was no reversibility for nobody. Okay, so this is why we want to initiate this, uh, initi this, this foundation uh, for our uh, uh, open stack, for our uh, public cloud uh, platform, and to uh, bring the people that want to share this, these values and to use our product, so download this code, but also help to develop this code. So we have uh, definitely open source, we have acquisitions, we have values. But again, if I may, um, the place is kind of crowded. I mean, American and Chinese cloud providers are already running the game here. So what's your you know, last secret recipe to win the battle? Yeah, good question. It's, yeah, it, it, in fact, what we're building, OpenStack, our OpenStack platform, we can run that as the public cloud. So we run a region and there was many customers that they are, they are on this region. But we have the customers that they want this platform as the hosted private cloud, just for one customer. And they want, they have, actually, they have a lot of customers. And they want us to run this, this, uh, the same platform uh, for another market. And this is where we are very good. And this is the market also that we are going after. Hosted, private, cloud. What, what do you really mean by that? So uh, 10 years ago, our customers, they asked us to to offer them VMware as a service. In the order to um, developing this, this offer, we became the worldwide expert of this hosted private cloud. In a few months, we will add on this uh, on hosted private cloud new platforms. Nutanix, OpenStack that we've just been talking about. There will be uh, uh, NetApp, EMC. Uh, our big customers, they want this kind of platform in order to run that for the internal needs, because they, they are facing uh, with the sovereignty issues, with data privacy. Uh, so um, this is what they are asking for. And you just uh, launched a brand new initiative with T-System. Is this, this very type of cloud we're looking for? The beauty of the hosted private cloud is that it scales from few servers to thousands. Uh, and uh, we had the, the customers that ask us more than 1,000 servers. And this is why for the extremely large customers, we build a new offer that we call data center as a service uh, because they need this hosted private cloud, not just in a uh, in few servers, but one data center or even more than one data center. And one of our first uh, customer is uh, T-System in Germany for this uh, service which definitely matches the mindset of what the brand new European mm. cloud could be. I mean, I'm talking about GAIA-X, of course. It's definitely that sovereignty and security are key. Yeah, the hosted private cloud, it's also much this sovereignty and the privacy because we are deploying the cloud specifically for one customer. And we already have the, these clouds running in the totally isolated data centers in France. This is Technium Cloud, uh, all the uh, markets. Uh, so again, we are running VMware, Nutanix, OpenStack, NetApp, EMC platforms in this specific data centers, isolated data centers for the just few markets, government, uh, military, healthcare, banks, uh, insurance companies. So Let's pause here for a second, because we've been talking extensively so far about your plans to win 
the cloud again. And, and it's kind of a bold strategy here. But if I do follow, and if we do come back to the basics of what OVH is, it's definitely about infrastructure. So do I have to understand you intend to leave this business? There was no public cloud without bar metal. There was no hosted private cloud without bar metal. In order to offer this new kind of cloud, hosted private cloud with the Nutanix, OpenStack, etc., also data center as a service, secure cloud, uh, we decided to rebuild the foundation, the foundations in our data centers. So you will see that on the website very soon. We will uh, release new ranges of the barometer cloud uh, by the end of this year, but also we started to integrate the standard hardware like OCP and very soon the other vendors in order to be able to expand our um, hosted private cloud in the customer's data centers, in the co-location, the standard data centers. So we will have the answer with our technologies, water cooling, etc., and also we'll be able to go after the standard data center with our software and to offer both to our customers. What an ecosystem experience to come. <laughs> Thank you so much, Octav. Do you. stay with me. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you. And we're back for the second part of this exclusive interview with Octav. Still kind of lucky because I have 15 more minutes of your time today. Uh, and I hear that you're focused on non-OVH project. Correct me if I'm wrong, are you still working for OVH Cloud? Of course, yes, I, I work for OVH Cloud. Uh, my focus in OVH Cloud is uh, development of strategic products and also long-term strategy. But thanks to Michel, our CEO, I have more time to do other things. So I'm, I'm passionate about a lot of different things. And uh, so I, I decided to just focus on five of them because, you know, a day is just 24 hours. 24 hours a day, indeed. Um, European independence, data privacy, those are still super close um, to your heart. How do you intend defending them? You know, uh, uh, the issue of the data, data privacy in Europe, it's a major concern of a lot of companies. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you're looking, for example, the collaborating tools, a lot of our customers, they're asking us the alternative solutions for Office 365 or G Suite. For the last two years, I've met more than 100 startups companies here in Europe that develops uh, the collaborating tools. So this is SaaS services, sometimes it's open source software, uh, in email, for the email, chat, video conferencing, cloud storage, uh, but they are not really collaborating. That's why the, there was no, all the features that they are needed in this tool, and it, the tools, they are not as simple to use as the popular tools. So what are you offering? So what I, um, you know, I'm, I'm really uh, passionate by the European digital independence, the data privacy and the sovereignty. Uh, this is why I, I, I want to create a team uh, that will uh, open source a software uh, and run that will aggregate all what we need to, to build a robust alternative to Office 365 and G Suite. This is probably five years or more project. The first step is it's the migration of one million cubic accounts to the open source uh, software named the Nextcloud. Isn't it supposed to be an internal OVH cloud project? Oh no, no, it's it's external project. So uh, as an external investor, I'm buying cubic from OVH cloud, and and we'll develop develop project independently from the company. The project will require more than 50 million euros of the investment. This kind of the investment, it's, it, it's not part of the OVH Cloud strategy. This is why I'm keeping that independent. And do you have any partnerships in mind to develop this project? So what we will do, we will do uh, two things. The first, with the team, between 20, 30 people in the next month, 
will build and run the platform. And on top of this platform, we'll collaborate with the partners in Europe to run their software on this platform. So the main goal is we'll, we'll be focused on user experience, login password, and how you can use all this different software, but just with one user experience. Uh, uh, and, and, and then all this de development of the, of the front end we will open source, so everybody will be able to download it, run it, and help us. So now, another project here is definitely GSB, the investment fund you've created. Am I talking to Octave Kleber, a VC today? Oh, it's a strange. <laughs> yes, no, maybe pair. I, I don't know. I don't know yet. But I, I, I needed to create this, uh, this fund, GSB, uh, you know, because I wanted to have this relationship with some startup and help them to grow. In the, I'm focusing on the hardware, on the infrastructure and the platform services, uh, and I want to help them. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just investing in the areas that I can understand well and I can help. If not, it not, doesn't make sense for me. And that's a quite an interesting mirror effect to me, which means that you're also going to be focusing on mentoring. I like this really, this relationship, okay, uh, based on the values. Uh, so I'm choosing the startup because there was something that we, uh, we I feel that uh, the founder shares uh, and I want to help them. So yes, yeah, they have my call number, uh, they can call me whatever they want and and then we, we can talk about the issues. But you know, whatever the technology is, startups, the, the entrepreneur uh, journey, it's all about the people, hiring, management, strategy, values. It's all the common foundation, and I love to talk about that. Mentoring as a service. <laughs> so it's definitely key, but as education. Yeah, education is another topic that I'm, I'm really focused on. You know, uh, uh, it's a huge challenge. It's really a huge challenge. The speed of change in this digital area has scared so many people who don't have the skills to keep up. They don't know how it works. They don't have, don't have the skills to really to understand. And I'm, I'm really focusing to see how we can just solve this issue, how we can help the people to understand and then find the jobs in this new a new digital world. So it's not only a question of getting the acculture, the acculturation to digital, no. right? It's also this idea that the digital means job. Yes, I, I want to discover the most effective way to train people in digital skills for the maximum result. That means jobs, new jobs. There was the innovative and a very effective trained models that there was there. There was a lot of people that saying, "I have an idea how to train people for this digital world." Great! If you have the idea, come and talk with me. I want to that this idea to test these ideas in Roubaix here in the in north of France, where we have the headquarters, uh, and to see if it works. If it works, we can scale it nationally. So, if you want to meet Octave, it's up to you now. But Roubaix will definitely act as a living lab for uh, this uh, initiative in the making. What the overall plan? So I want to invest 5 million per year in 50 initiatives uh, to train young and employed people, residents of, of Roubaix. Uh, each initiative has to seek out and train 10, 15, 20 people in digital skills for three to 12 months. And if participants are employed after the training, that's success. So we'll test it at the larger scale here in Roubaix. And if it's still working, let's share it with, on the, with everybody nationally, saying, hey guys, we have an idea that's working. If you use this training everywhere in France, you will find the jobs. Step by step, proof of concept. That's the mindset, of course, but another mindset for 2020 is definitely sustainability. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm passionate about sustainability. You know, this is why 10 years ago, 
I decided to invest in the startup is the wind turbines. Um, so they, they build nine, nine turbines, uh, um, wind farm in France. But the business model didn't work. It costed really a lot of money. Um, so OVH tried to resell the startup, but there were no buyer, no buyers for, for that. This is why I decided to spend time rebuilding the business model. And I've come to an idea that, okay, maybe it can work. Maybe this new business model can work. Cloud and wind seems to be <laughs> like a win-win situation, of course. Uh, but still, how are you going to achieve this? You know, an external investor, I'm buying the startup from OVH Cloud. Okay. And we'll test this technology deploying 30 wind turbines in the next three years. We'll design construct, deploy, and operate the small wind farms in the industrial zones here in France. Uh, it's a really risky strategy because, you know, it's so different from how the wind energy is currently produced. But I'm confident that this business model can work. At least mm -hmm. I want to try it. <laughs> but still, I don't understand what the magic inside the technology this startup has been able to develop in terms of wind turbines. Yeah, it's 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 really different from where the market is. Just give me uh, three examples. Mm -hmm. uh, so our wind turbines, they are not very high. They are 50 meters. And you comparing to the market, it's 150, 200. They are small. They are 800 kilowatts and not three, five megawatts. And we don't want to have the visual impact uh, so we are we want to deploy them in the industrial zones in France, okay? So those few different things that we are going after, and I think this can work because of that. We'll see. Now, last but definitely not the least, we're definitely going to speak about one tradition here at OVH Cloud. It's you, Octave, playing live on stage. It's of course it's your passion. It's music. Um, I've heard that you're going to release a new album. Yes. Uh, so every year on Summit, I play the guitar. Okay. okay. It's it's a, it's a just a, now the event that it really allows me to play and having 200 people mm -hmm. for free. Okay, listening to <laughs> my music. Okay. But uh, you know, last last year on Summit, I played for the first time my own song that I composed. And what happened is that after Summit, someone contacted me and saying, wow, I really like your song. I, I, li I listen to this song uh, every morning. So I said, wow. Uh, so this really inspired me and saying, okay, let's, let's, let's compose 12, month, 12 songs. So this is what I have done. Uh, and I re released the album. So during the, all this COVID quarantine, I was working all the evenings and all the weekends to just to assemble all these materials. And when I felt in June that I'm ready, I called my friend uh, Bruno, that is a musical producer, and I said, okay, I'm ready, let's go. That's been a quite productive uh, quarantine to me. Um, are you ready to take the stage with your band? So right now we're still working. We are recording the song. The songs, uh, we are in studio, we are yeah, just working hard on this album. And the end of this year, I think we'll be able to release this album. Uh, there will be the single next year, uh, there will be a video clip, and we will see how this album is received. If the people like it, the band will go on tour. At least I want to explore how I can move people emotionally through the music. See, entrepreneur at core, you can help it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you very much. We are lucky enough to actually leave you uh, with a release of season two, your album though, and the tune is called Ride of Your Life. So let's ride. <music>